Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 95. Why aren't we here at 100 yet? Uh, you, more demands, yes, is it, for the demands. 90s? It's like, oh God, come on. What happens at 100? I don't know. Cannons and fireworks and... War, apparently. <laughs> In a fun way. In a f- <laughs> like confetti cannons covered in oh, good. Full, of, full of glitter and can you imagine actually if there was a war way back when and they rolled out the cannon and someone had put glitter in it going surprise I'm like you fool you've cost us the battle <laughs> look all these people are dead but they look fabulous they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh how are you nick i'm all right You're wishing right? i had a glitter cannon now yeah no, i don't but an old-timey glitter cannon oh was, you... uh, yeah i want to be like that person in mary poppins on the top of the like the captain in Mary Poppins. This on- is the second time you've said that. You do yeah, realise that. Yeah, absolutely. So, but this time I want a glitter cannon. I want that cannon and I want it full of glitter. Yep, every day at 12. Yeah, every day at 12. Firing glitter, glitter. all the way across Canterbury. Killing birds as you do it. Absolutely. Me down below Blinding just going, don't worry. by as they get shards of glitter in their faces. <laughs> it's great. getting dark. There I see them stumbling around, getting run over by cars as they wander <laughs> into the into the streets. It's great fun. Uh, uh, will you be the captain or will you have or was he an admiral? Was it I think it was an admiral, wasn't an it? Admiral. Yeah, what it was rank an ar- would you have? Oh, I'd be like Commodore or something. That's an air <laughs> that's an air thing, isn't it? No, you could do Commodore on the on the on the high seas on, the, on, on a boat. Or you could just make up a totally different title. <laughs> <laughs> the Grand Dam of the Rooftop. <laughs> Grand Admiral. <laughs> Grand Admiral of the Cannon. <laughs> I mean, either way, you can say that what you want. Yeah, as exactly. I've got a fucking cannon. I can call myself what I like. Yeah, as they're dragging you to the asylum. <laughs> Any poisonings this week? No, but lots of cannons. <laughs> Poisoning the people who have the cannons exactly. that you all want. Oh, arsenic guns. Arsenic guns. <laughs> Just thought of that. It's still a cannon full of arsenic. Arsenic and glitter together. Yeah. Fired into the sky. It's a beautiful treat that becomes deadly. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds <laughs> like, just, now we're moving into sort of like weapons of mass destruction now, so perhaps not. It does. It's like those <laughs> those old adverts you got for nuclear war where the yeah. children look up in the sky going, Ah, oh, oh, it's all glittery in China. Oh, look, my face has <laughs> melted. So, <laughs> What kind of arsenic is this? Radioactive arsenic. We're moving on. But I don't want that. No, that sounds horrible. Good. No poisonings then this week. No. You're sure? <laughs> My brain, apparently. Yes. Well, speaking of firing cannons into the air with various things loaded in them and and melting children's faces, I think mm. it's time for us to thank our delicious yeah. Patreon subscribers. They've done all of those things. They have. So thank you very much to um, Carla Swisher. To Madeline Scarborough. To Jesse666666. Six, 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 six. <laughs> I don't know. There are lots of S's and lots of X's in that name. Nice. Sexy. So there we go. To Sarah Rayner Byler. And to Maggie Barnes. You're all marvellous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very, very sexy. All the cannons for you. All of them. Extra cannon, especially for Madeline's sister, Sarah. Madeline asked us to do a lovely shout out for her sister, Sarah. I don't know if it's the same Sarah who's joined Patreon. I, I think there's more than one Sarah in the world. I have heard that there might be two. Never. Their paths shall never meet. <laughs> until they battle each other somewhere on top of It's like of crossing it. the streams. If two Sarah should ever oh, meet, oh, no. oh, the world will end horribly. <laughs> or there's a second coming of a third yeah. Sarah who will save us all. Anyway, Sarah, happy birthday. <laughs> happy, happy birthday from your sister Madeline. She can't wait to drink cocktails with you and talk about poison or, well, see where the evening takes yes. you. see what happens. Well, Nick, are you ready? Mm-hmm. To drink cocktails, talk about poison. I think we probably should. Or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. No, nope. I want a cocktail. I want a cocktail. You want a cocktail. I want a cocktail. Have you had your pre-cocktail cocktail? Ah, uh, you might have noticed I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've been on the Negronis. I've been on the Negronis already. <laughs> Swilling them in front of me, going, <laughs> <laughs> Look what I can have and you can't. <laughs> Uh, I could have it. I choose not to. That's you choose nice. wrongly. You have chosen poorly. <laughs> you have chosen poorly. <laughs> You're just swilling it in the Holy Grail, actually, and you come in just to really rub it in. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. I, you, we should start drinking. You okay. Should, we should start drink, you drinking, filling you with booze, and I will drink whatever concoction has come out of my mind. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think. know what that is. Good. We'll go with the first one anyway, because as you know, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, each week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavour our cocktail of the week. Master of this week's so my pick. And this week's secret ingredient is smoke. Yes. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm. An intriguing one. Yes, there were lots of possibilities. Full of possibilities. Full of possibilities. Full of possibilities. And yet yes. you cannot capture them, for they are like smoke on the wind. <laughs> Oi. Yeah, okay, you could drink them. <laughs> or I can stand outside making these metaphors where you're inside stirring drinks going, yeah, yeah. okay, just leave her yeah, out you, there. you do that, whatever. She's clearing a blockage, I don't know. <laughs> smoke. So Go there are the smoke. smoke, you can make a smoking cocktail with dry ice and the such, but that seems like a cheat. Yeah, not very smoky. I, don't, I have I have issues with dry ice and cocktails. Why? Mainly because you drink them and you're going to dissolve your insides if you're not careful. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because well, there are hotels that in in bars where they do it, not proper cocktail bars, but they bars just go to Weatherspoons or something, um, <laughs> some cheapy nasty chain bar, yeah. um, and they make these fancy cocktails that look fancy with dry ice, mm. but they don't. People don't let the dry ice sort of fully evaporate, and then people end up swallowing mouthfuls of dry ice. Oh god! Which sort of like just like burns their insides out, Oy. and then people have no hospital and all that sort of stuff. So no, I know I feel it's just entirely pointless. It's a silly thing. Well, I was looking this up and and was thinking, do we do something smoky visually? I mean, this is a podcast so it was all about the visuals apparently but in america i found a lot more u.s websites where they were saying have dry eyes for halloween and there seemed to be dry ice that you could pick up in the supermarket so maybe it's better yeah. manufactured over there and this is for well, kids parties no, as well I think it's just more readily available than it is over here yeah because um, you have to order it in from specialists and things like that too but it's not real yeah. smoke because it's dry ice it's exactly what it it's the opposite it's, of it's, smoke it's carbon dioxide exactly um, and we don't want any of that gimmicky shit up in our no. crib so none of that um then you also have the option of actually smoking cocktails but then that inquires some kit which i don't have so how would you smoke them there are a few different ways very popular one is to smoke the glass yes you know like you have like an absinthe rinse or something like that in your glass if you're making a absinthe cocktail you can do the same with smoke so Mm. basically you get some wood chips or something hickory Mm -hmm. and things like that and you set them alight and you put your glass over that to capture the smoke in your glass and then you have a smoky essence deposited on the inside of your glass <laughs> and then you pour your cocktail in and it's very lovely. And it is very lovely because I've had those in, in natural cocktail bars and it's very, very nice. And I had read a recipe that I almost did, but then the rest of the recipe was a little bit disappointing, but it uh, did recommend a non-alcoholic cocktail with sort of lemon and ginger in it, but it, it, it wasn't terribly fascinating. But it recommended getting some thyme mm, yes, and indeed. smoking the glass with the thyme. So I was very close to doing that, but then I thought, oh, we can do better, we can do better. You've had that and you also get that with rosemary a lot as well. Ooh, if, yes. you, if you like rosemary and you have that so it's smoldering as a garnish or something oh. that is that's that's quite a popular thing that i've that i've seen as well but none of that but none of that but you can get like smoking guns which i'm very tempted to actually buy one because they look fun is mm. it a murder weapon no that is it's a little it's almost like a blowtorch but it has a little compartment that you put in sort of wood chips oh. so Ooh. you can, can you make passes a current over it which burns these wood chips and creates smoke so you but it's I'll much more controlled that. so you can do it in a glass or in like a, a dome cloche type thing um, yeah. So it's much more control. So that, that's quite tempting. That sounds like your like that. sort of so thing for the cabinet. It sounds like my sort of thing that I would use once and go, oh, look at this, and then never use again. <laughs> um, which is very much my sort of thing in a lot of parts exactly. of my life. Exactly. At um, least then you have it, should you ever need it. So, Better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. This is this is very true. Also I, I, thought that you meant that you were just going to order a smoking gun as in some sort of Agatha Christie weapon. <laughs> that would be a talking point yes, for parties. I, I've, I've ordered a murder weapon. Yes. <laughs> that, that has been used. <laughs> <laughs> you leave in the living room and go, oh, that, just ignore it. <laughs> wink, wink. So potentially, for my next murder mystery, I may well do that. So no actual smoky gimmicks, maybe no in the future. Gimmicks. You can also get liquid smoke as well. Why have I heard of that? Is liquid smoke an ingredient it that is, you can yes. use in cooking? It, you can use it in cooking. Some people use it in cocktails as well. It's very much designed to sort of attempt to replicate a barbecue effect without having a barbecue. Nice, so you can which is in, always what you want in well, cocktails. You can, so you can put, well, not, it's, it was designed originally not for cocktails, but for like mm. meats and things like that. So you can create a marinade and stuff like that. That's but, where I've without heard of having, it. Without actually doing a barbecue because you don't have a barbecue. So Aye. you can get that smoky thing. And people <laughs> have started using it as a, in cocktails. And I have used it once and it is utterly vile. Okay, none of that. Or I just used the, very, the wrong one or something. Or I used too much or too little. It was not pleasant. So we haven't gone with any of that either. No. <laughs> Big what? old list of stuff we haven't done. <laughs> but this is good. It's good to talk about the smoking ingredients in cocktails because people had a lot of suggestions this week. And whatever we say, this is this is fodder that you can use in the future. So yeah. be careful of the dry ice, uh, the smoking of the glass. I'm intrigued by that. Try 
that in the future. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, don't, I do want to try that because that looks that looks interesting. I think we should. I don't have any hickory chips. Burn some dining chairs or something. No, 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 no! Don't do that. I've got I've got a fence out back. Let's burn that. Yeah, that lovely piney and mixed with rum seal. Yes, <laughs> that's what everybody Ooh, the wants. Hint of creosote in your old fashioned. That's yeah. just what you want. Yeah, that's much safer than dry yeah. ice. So I I went for a. A smoky drink, a smoky Ooh, beverage, lovely. Um, rather than actual smoke. Okay, so what are we having? So we are going to have a fire and brimstone. Oh, yay. Fire and brimstone. Don't know what that is, but it sounds good. Well, it sounds smoky. And smoky. it has some smoky things going on, so. <laughs> That's exciting. Well, I have also made a cocktail this week, the non-alcoholic portion. Boo. But well I am quite excited about this. I had done some research into, well, what the hell can you do with smoke? Are there smoke named uh, cocktails, non-alcoholic ones? Did consider the smoking glass, but... I've got a little something that I think Nick is potentially going to like. I'm intrigued. Well, it can't be much worse than last week's one. I mean, so. everything is is up from there. Yeah. I don't think you can get much lower than just the bottom of the trench in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> basically, which is where that cocktail Your has been buried. Potato monster. <laughs> potato water. <laughs> no, I really stepped up the game this week. So I'm going to make for you. I'm going to make for you two options, oh, but wow. the main one is a smoky cokey. A smoky cookie. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I'm I'm there for it. I'm, I'm there for a smoky cookie. A smoky cookie. Smoky cookie. But I'm also going to try and mix up a twist on a paloma. But okay. the smoke will be revealed. The smoke will be revealed. All will be revealed behind a smoke screen, behind another thing of is, dry is this ice. As you go into my kitchen and set it on fire. I've just had it with you, <laughs> that's it. it. Just had it with all this. I'm gonna burn Nick's house down. I'm gonna have a <laughs> glass of coke and then just set the house on fire and just go, fuck you, Nick. Nick just that's smoky enough! <laughs> flipping the V's as I go, enjoy your Negroni in hell! Well, that sounds fun. Well, <laughs> with such delights on the menu, I think it is high time for us to go into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm, so we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, you'll have a fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone. <laughs> yes. Feels I like want, that. I want, like, Carmen in the background. Of the Carmen? Carmen. Or that Carmen Burana, that sort of big... Carmina right. Burana. Carmina, that's the one. Oh, Carmina yeah. Burrata. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so yes, some creamy much. cheese, yeah, yes. Absolutely. While everyone's in hell, like, oh, it's delicious, yes. Right, <laughs> <high star. laughs> yes, it looks very nice, your cocktail. It's got a cute little garnish, Nick. Yes. Look at you going all out for yourself. For me, going, ah, oh, it's only me. <laughs> it's fine. Push the boat out. Well, it looks very intriguing. So are you going to have a little sip first? Do I get my tiny one tiny Maybe. millimeter we'll sip? S- we'll see how good it is first. Okay. See, if it's horrible enough for you to have some. If it's nice, then it's all mine. Okay, so you're going to dive in and taste. But yeah, golden drink, golden-y. Yeah, golden-y. The golden-y fiery brimstone. Fiery brimstone. Go for it. Oh, it smells nice. (laughs) 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 Oh, that was was a look. I don't think I've ever seen that look on Nick's face before. (laughs) He's still smiling. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe not for (laughs) long. Oh, you're right. Go on then. Okay, go get, this is my one tiny quota. I am having literally a tiny sip. So uh, wish me luck, guys. Oh, I'll cherish every second. Yeah, as you should. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, brother. Yeah, say it's told you. <laughs> what did you do, Nick? I what made a you... fiery cocktail. God, my God. It's actual fire. <laughs> what did you think that you would just burn my taste buds off? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, not into it, I'm to quite, be fair. I'm quite liking that. That's... um. Oh, that's got a kick. Yes. So you, I'm going to guess there's some chilli. There's definitely some chilli in there. Now, you have to be into chilli to enjoy that. I love a bit of chilli. I didn't think it was going to be quite so warm. I thought it might be slightly more. It's not horrendous. I mean, it's not painfully hot. It depends Um, on your threshold, really. You you don't mind a spicy meal. I don't mind a spicy thing. I'm very, very good with spicy stuff. That is a lot of nice, clean spice. I mean, I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm not. I don't know if I'm tasting much else around it, but it's not like it's obliterated. There's something citrusy and fresh. It's a nice drink, but you're getting um, a lot of chilli. There's also mezcal. We'll show us some smokiness coming hey! through from the mezcal. Oh, in there. sweet, sweet mezcal. Sweet, sweet, smoky mezcal. Chilli. Contra. Ooh, A bit nice. of orangey, orangey twang. Citrus from the lime juice and a bit of agave to sort of round oh, the whole thing. Like proper off. Mexican nice proper cocktail. Me- yeah, so it's actually... 
very pleasant. That is really nice. You it's, have it's to like your one, chili. Yeah, you have to like your chili. And it's not one to sit there and down. It's a sipper. It's not one you want to knock it back because you <laughs> would explode. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be interested to see how you develop with this. Yes, that's an excellent cocktail to listen to a story with. Mm. If I had to read the story and drink that, I think we'd be in trouble. Oh, yeah, because every, every, every time you, you took a mouthful, you'd be like, Hula, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I mean, there's going to be a noise in the background as I open a bottle of sparkling water and drink it. Sorry. <laughs> mm. Mm. Ooh, lip smacking. <laughs> Ooh, it's got a tang to it. I'm uh, of the opinion that stuff like that is really good for a hangover. Mm. The spice, you know, you need to get the blood flowing. You need to kind of go, oh, something with a kick to it. And maybe the pain in your mouth will detract from the, the darkness and the headache that you have. That, I wouldn't say there's pain. I mean, that's that's got two little chilies in, that one. Ooh. For that whole thing. So it's, it's, it's so you could, it's you could half that. So it's, it's, it's a fair amount. They're not, they're not like crazy, scary chilies. Just your average. They're just your average supermarket. Put yeah. them in your soup sort of chilies. Red chilies. Um, <laughs> soup. <laughs> like so, it. yeah. So they're not ah. crazy, crazy chilies. But you could, you could easily dial it down with a chilli. Lovely. Well, mm. that is lovely. That's well, delicious. Well, you have produced a whole smorgasbord of, of non-alcoholic well, I'm assuming they're non-alcoholic. They are non-alcoholic. Things in front of me. There's a whole selection of cocktails. It never yes. has the table been so overflowing. Well, you know me. I, I found an ingredient and I thought, let's try it two ways. Mm. Because, yeah, to see if it works and, and let's experiment a bit. It might be... I've no idea whether it will be your cup of tea, whether you'll like it or not. But let's start with the smoky cookie. Now, this one looks like you've just given me a glass of Coke with some lime. It's a simple concoction, <laughs> but I will okay. explain afterwards of why it is smoky cookie. So let's let's dive in and give it a go. Yes. Mm. Oh, I mean, it's perfectly pleasant. Mm-hmm. Getting smoke there? Not especially, I must admit. No, maybe the, the Coke in there is down getting, into Getting Disney. a lot of sweetness. Well, I might give so. you a little taster of the main ingredient that's in so this. What is the main ingredient? I'm so the intrigued. main ingredient, it, well, you've got we've got diet coke. Yeah, yeah, well, that is the, our preference. So. Yes, diet coke, a squeeze of lime, and this is flavoured with cross sips dandy smoke. Dandy smoke. Dandy smoke. Now, I did taste a little bit of this when it arrived before I've made the cocktails, and I'm very impressed by the flavours. Zero percent alcohol. It is by cross sip. They also do donations of their sales to good causes. But this is described as a luxurious, meaty and smoky, non-alcoholic dark spirit. It's the one you've been waiting for. So sweet, smoky lapsang and yep. top notes of pine. The body comes through with a deep fruit, cinnamon and clove. Now, it promises a lot. Yeah, I mean, this is like we're in the back of a wine label. It's excellent <laughs> with salmon. It goes excellent with all of the things. <laughs> but when I tasted it, I thought it was a really, really delicious complex I mean, of flavours. It's so, very pleasant. Non-alcoholicness indeed. Mm. So Nick, try it on its own and see what you yeah. think. Oh, it has, it has a smoky aroma, it mm. has to be said. I mean, it's, it's, it's not objectionable. I'm not entirely sure. If it had booze in it, would you be going, mmm, delicious? It reminds me of something, and I can't put my finger on it. You mentioned in the Lapsang in yeah. the thing. There's definitely a tea sort of Yeah, so when I was in there. when um, I was looking up options for, for non-alcoholic cocktails, it's called the Dandy Smoke, and I thought, well, let's give it a go for this one. But I think it's quite it's nice. For me, it's, it's, it's entirely, perfectly, perfectly pleasant. I mean, if, you, if I had that in a bar or something like that, or you if I was at your place and you said that, I would not object in the yes. slightest. So. Well, they've also suggested on the website, they have loads of different cocktails, but they did suggest a Paloma. Now, which I... Normally, like smoky, you can have mezcal with yeah, a paloma. That's going to be interesting. I did have to improvise slightly because trying to find grapefruit soda in the UK yeah, is incredibly easy. difficult. So I use some grapefruit juice with some sparkling water with lime and also with some agave syrup and this. So I've mixed one up for Nick. It's all stirred up with ice. So uh, have a taste, see what you think. Yeah. It could be terrible, this. <laughs> I like that. It's nice. And the Which smokiness the... that I miss from mezcal mm. and that I'd miss from alcohol and giving it a little bit of depth of flavour. I think that's really nice. I oh, per- I'd yeah. chuck that back. <laughs> <laughs> perfectly, perfectly pleasant beverages. Mm. I know I'm twisting your arm for you yeah. to go like, well, it's just not got booze in it. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to say, oh yes, I'm never going to have a plumber again. Give me those all the time. No, um, and I don't think this is intended to go, hey, this is better than the original. But it is, it's a perfectly nice drink. My yeah. approach to things this January is rather than just having the inevitable squash. Well, it's, it's certainly better than having a, a glass of lemonade or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't straight away think, oh, that's non-alcoholic. That, and that's a good, that's so, a good benchmark, isn't it? Yeah. I, I would just say, it's a, it's a cocktail that's perhaps not quite my taste. I, would, I wouldn't straight go to. But you wouldn't just go, ooh, yeah, I can tell there's no And also, I mean, mainly my 
tongue is, is somewhat numb now from the, <laughs> from the, the chili. Damn um, it, I should have given you those ones beforehand. Yeah, you should have, my, my lips are slightly tingly. <laughs> and then the booze is the reward. So they know, but lots of variants on smoke. You've got smokiness with the mezcal, deliciousness, fire and brimstone, the You've fire. You've got the fieriness and the chili. You, and where um, does smoke come from? Mouths are on fire. fire. My mouth actually is on fire. <laughs> you see, you're going to appreciate these non-alcoholic cocktails <laughs> now because they're quite refreshing. You may have overdone the chili on that one. Cross sip dandy smoke you can buy online. We're not sponsored. This is, we pay for everything. It's just trying it out. There's so many non-alcoholic gins out there which are just flavoured water. And I'm yeah. really bored yeah. with them. So that is an alternative with a glass, glass of Coke I'm happy with. Nice. Mm. Well, with the fire and brimstone burning Nick like that scene in the Raiders <laughs> of the Lost Ark. Yes. Me very smug over here with my lovely refreshing dandy smoke cocktails. Yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. bitter inside, but not as much as I normally am. Not as much as last <laughs> week. Are you ready for a story? Yes. Yay. This week's story has it all, I tell you. Does it? We've got a country house. Okay. We've got a dark and stormy night. Nice. We have a brutal murder. Excellent. We have lots of gossip swirling around a small English neighbourhood. Mm. And a mystery on our hands. What more could one want for an evening? For a cold January evening, we are going to tell a chilling tale and we are off to the charming Suffolk village of Peasenhall. And it is Peasenhall. 1902. Okay. So Peasenhall is a very quaint, pretty place. Uh, it's got a prominent Methodist community, but it's a very nice quintessential English, sort of slightly rural village. Peasenhall is famous today still for its pride of peacocks. Is it? That roam freely through the village. Okay. It's a very flamboyant area with gangs of fancy birds. Not gangs. Gangs isn't the collective <laughs> noun for peacocks, sorry. I don't, I don't know what is. It, it is pride. A pride of peacocks. A pride of peacocks. Sense. I mean, they are fabulous, but they're not gangs. They're not hanging around the street corners, flipping dimes and burning cars. But in this village is Providence House, home to Mr. and Mrs. Crisp. Nice. And their servant, Rose Harsent. Now, Providence House isn't a massive country manor. I've got to no. disappoint you there. But if you want to picture it like that, go ahead. Go <laughs> ahead. It's a quite a nice house. And again, yeah. the, the, the couple there, they have staff. You know, not acres and acres of land and acres and acres of staff. But they have people. People ah. to tend to them. And one of them is Rose Harsent. Now, Rose is, by all accounts, a beautiful young woman. 22 years of age. And she is not short of admirers mm. in the village. She She's good at her job and she certainly attracts attention from male admirers. You know, there's not a lot of young women around. And she apparently is only too happy to encourage the admiration oh, of indeed. others. Yes, indeed. Now, this may be a slight embellishment of the story across time. Because what happens when you have a pretty young girl who has admirers, people are very quick to turn around and say, oh, she must have been courting the attentions of men. What a tramp. It's all her it's fault. All her fault. Anything that befell her is all her fault. But it appears that at least a couple of men are very taken with her most of them are writing her letters and they are writing letters and dirty poems nice and there are even a few drawings included Who in doesn't her letters. love a dirty poem yes and a few drawings yeah early version of dick pics here <laughs> sketches dick <laughs> sketches dick sketches i don't know if there's another word for it cock sketches i don't know She's like, what is this? Oh, God! <laughs> now, Rose also sang in the local choir at the Methodist Chapel. It's about 10 minutes from her home. Her mistress also attended the chapel. The master of the house was the church deacon. And as a result, Rose would clean the chapel once a week in addition to her household duties. So, yes, serving the village. Mm. Lovely. But it was through the church of all places that Rose became acquainted with one of her alleged admirers. <gasps> William Gardner. He is a local carpenter. In fact, he's a foreman of the local factory where a lot of people work. He's also the chapel's choir master. Nice. Organist. Or, or, both. Knows how to handle an organ. Multi-talented. A Sunday school teacher as well. Married with six children. Okay. But he has been seen speaking with young Rose on more than one occasion. You know, having a few conversations, sitting together in church. I mean, that sort of thing would probably raise an eyebrow in this well, kind he, of village. she's in the choir and he's the choir master, you would mm. expect some level of conversation to go on between them. And maybe this is just gossip, indeed, as you said. Maybe it is just the villagers going, oh, young woman, and he's talking to her. <laughs> the scandal. Well, this gossip reaches its peak one evening. Rose is cleaning the chapel and a young man named William Wright spotted William Gardner going into the chapel after Rose unaccompanied. <gasps> now, William Wright knows just what to do. He runs and gets his mate and comes back to spy on them. Quite right. The man's name is Alfonso Skinner. Great name. Yeah. And they come back and creep up to the door and listen to, for the sounds inside. 
Okay. They claim that they hear laughter, they hear rustling, and a woman moaning. <gasps> Not in the church. The church. My God, no. Wright claimed that he could overhear them having a conversation about passages in the Bible. Really? Specifically, chapter 38 of Genesis. Where they start moaning a lot. They do. That is just pages and pages of them moaning. Uh, in all seriousness, this is about Judah, that, that chapter of Genesis, where it is just him and his extended family shagging. Nice. There's okay. lots of descriptions of sex. Let us reenact the Bible. <laughs> I think it goes along the lines of allegedly it was, I was reading my Bible. I was thinking of you. You know the passage, don't you? Which passage? Chapter 38 of Genesis. <laughs> you probably have to get a Bible. <laughs> no, they would all know Ooh, the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> and they would go, oh, oh my. <laughs> If he turned to the wrong bit going, and then they flayed them on the hill. What? <laughs> yes. No, shagging, shagging. Yeah, there's lots of references to spilling semen and, and things like that. Nice. Genesis. <laughs> they pulls no punches. Fun times. It's also a lot of ingenuo begat our and our begat. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of sexy, sexy talk. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So the two men who are overhearing this 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 frantic heated this Bible begetting. talk <laughs> the spilling of things, they work at the same factory as Gardner. And when the gossip starts to spread in the workplace, you know, pair of lads sharing some saucy news, Gardner, it gets back to him and he challenges them on it, mm -hmm. calling them liars and saying, no, I, I will not stand for this, even threaten, threatens legal action oh. against them. The gossip in this small village like this would spiral so much that on the 11th of May, the Methodist church itself, the elders, held a small internal inquiry into these allegations. And they spoke to both the lads who were spreading the rumours and Gardner. And he said, no, nothing is going on. I only stopped by the chapel that night to help Rose open a stiff door. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> There'd been no impropriety whatsoever. None at all. No innuendo whatsoever no and william makes quite the fuss over no i won't stand for this i am going to get legal action i've spoken to a lawyer i'm speaking to a lawyer right now i want a written apology mm. the guys don't back down okay they are sticking to their guns and going no no written apology from us the church elders kind of go back and forth and go listen this is too much hearsay we, we we've not got any evidence either way let's just let this drop we don't want it talked about again now, whether the boys are smart enough to think, you know what, we've got far less to lose than he has, so even if we are making up stuff, then let's just stick to our guns. Or, even with the face of legal action, which would be costly, they really, really believe that mm. what they're talking about, they actually are saying, no, it's true. Yeah. Otherwise, Come they, at if, me. If, yeah, I mean, if they didn't, if they backed down, then they would be branded as liars and things in the, in the, in the village and things, and yeah, you wouldn't be class as that sort of person so during this back and forth william gardner wrote to rose and he says i'm very much surprised to hear there is scandal around you and me reiterating that of course he knows of course they both understand it's not true and that he is indeed pursuing legal action if needed and he was going to speak to his solicitor to get this written retraction from the lads he told her he'd even told his wife about the matter and she is of course very upset to hear about these salacious rumors now as we said the men do not retract their statement. The Methodist Church just says, drop it. And even Gardner's lawyer advises him to let the matter drop and pretty much suggests that this might be a life lesson for Gardner. There seems to be general feeling about these rumours that if these guys aren't back backing down, they're either confident enough, as I said, or they are smart enough to just keep pushing yeah. this. It would be very expensive for Gardner to continue and maybe he is the one who has to sort of look at himself and own up internally to what's happened. I think everyone's kind of going, look, mate, no one's going to ask any more questions. Yes. You just need to let this drop and uh, maybe think about it next time. A small community, gossip won't do circulating. So he is advised and he promises, oh, I have nothing to do with Rose anymore. I'm absolutely not going to speak to her. No way, Jose. <laughs> Mm. While he's assuring that he wants nothing more to do with her, people still notes that he is seen walking out with her over the coming weeks. They continue to sit next to each other at church. She visits his house when his wife is in, mm. reporting to be friends with the wife, and they are seen alone together in the street. And this is just not appropriate, so the gossip is still circulating. Yeah. Everyone keeping officially quiet about spreading any more rumours, but they're keeping a beady eye on their shenanigans. On the 31st of May, 1902, 
The heat of the day was beginning to swell into a thunderstorm, a big storm for the area. Dark clouds rolling in, thunder and lightning are beginning to rattle through the sky and there is a terrible, terrible downpour. It's so tumultuous that the gardener's neighbour asked the couple to come and sit with her during the storm until it ends later that evening. She knows it's coming and she's quite Mm. frightened. William was standing in the doorway of his house at around 10pm watching the storm and a local bricklayer stops to say hello to him, seeing him there. The man notices that there is a single light in the window of Providence House, which is a short walk from William's house. And he notes it and he notes that William is looking at it. Now, both Mr and Mrs Gardner do go to the neighbour's house. Allegedly, they sit there until 1.30am when the worst of the storm has passed and then they go home to bed. Mrs. Gardner had got up in the night to tend the children, but William slept through the night Mm -hmm. the next morning. Rose's father goes to Providence House, knocking on the servant's door. He calls there every Sunday to deliver fresh linen to the house for his daughter and say hello to her. Hearing no reply, but suspecting his daughter is at work, he enters as he normally would to drop off the delivery. As he enters the kitchen he is confronted with the sight of his daughter's body. Rose lay at the foot of the stairs in a pool of blood. Oh dear. And is quite dead. Quite, quite dead. Quite, quite dead. She's wearing her nightgown. Her throat has been cut. She's been stabbed in the chest. There were knife wounds on her hands and arms and shoulder, most likely defence wounds. Yeah, defensive, absolutely. The bottom half of her body also has burn marks. Her nightclothes and her skin as if someone has tried to burn part of the body. Wow. And the smell of smoke and paraffin (laughs) linger in the air. Now, Cram that in there. It was a little bit. It was a little tenuous because it was either that or paraffin, and I didn't think you'd want me to do that. That's very true. I appreciate that. (laughs) So smoke. Oh, it's a horrible smoky scene. Around the body, there is a burned candle, Mm. a smashed paraffin lamp, a medicine bottle, Oh. also lies on the ground, again broken, but the medicine bottle had contained paraffin, not medicine. Oh. There's also a partially burned copy of the East Anglian Times newspaper, which may have started the fire yes. that failed to burn her. So this horrible scene Rose's father is confronted yeah. with, he has to cover his daughter with a rug and call the authorities. The Crisps themselves, wonderful name for the family, <laughs> they figure very lightly in this story. Okay. Are, they, they, are they alive at this point? They are alive, they, they're they in are, the house. They are un, unharmed. Mrs Crisp would later say that she had heard a scream in the night. She woke up to go and investigate, but her husband said, no, come back to bed. If it's Rose, she'll probably it's she'll only call the, us. It's only the servants. It's late. <laughs> I can't even with you. No. Uh, I mean, that's that's it. That's it from them. Right, okay. <laughs> now, a doctor arrives on the scene, examines Rose, found the cuts to her neck and chest, and determines that she must have died after midnight. And he also goes, I, I think it's suicide. Oh, for fuck's sake. Doctors. Yeah, obviously, this is how you kill yourself. By by cutting your throat, falling down the stairs, and setting yourself on fire. Pretty much, yeah, just to be absolutely sure. (laughs) I know. Classic way of taking your own life. I know they don't want to leap to murder straight away, and you don't want to think that in the village, but suicide, a little bit of a stretch, mate. You are really, really just messing about here. The county police turn up. The local constable is like, uh, I don't know. And the county police is like, oh, for God's sake. Even they are kind of, uh, you know, not the, the not the big boys who are who are here. They take over. Rural doctor who was probably one step away from claiming her womb climbed out of her stomach and killed her. They shove him out the door. Get out. Get out. And an inquest is set up at the Swan Pub, where it is determined that either her throat being cut or the chest wound, either of those wounds would have killed her. Yeah. They also refine the time of death to between twelve midnight and four a.m. And they also discover Rose is six months pregnant. Ooh. Ta ta That no Ooh. one knew about. No one knew that. No yes. one knew. So, of course, the gossip mongers are in a frenzy. An unwed girl, quite advanced state of pregnancy. I say, what, when do you start to show? She would have been showing. Yes, yeah, so she would, she would have been, been showing. At this point. I suppose back then, though, lots of frocks. Big, big frocks and things. Uh, loose so. smock. There are yeah. some reports that both Mrs. Crisp. And Rose's own mother asked her, are you pregnant? I asked her outright and she denied it. She just denied uh, it. She absolutely denied it. So what she thought 
she could get away with or maybe she didn't even realize who yeah, knows maybe, who yeah. knows but two women at least have apparently asked her outright but she has denied it she is saying no way so whether she's wearing loose clothing whatever the circumstances she is six months pregnant okay but if she's pregnant then who is the daddy yes mm, who could it be who could it possibly possibly be they search through rose's belongings and they do find this collection that i mentioned earlier on collection of letters and filthy poems and drawings <laughs> from a man named fred davis oh one of Rose's many admirers, who has pined for her from afar for years. But Fred, the police determine, has no motive to kill mm. her. There's no evidence that they've ever had a physical relationship. It just seems like he has been watching her from afar, sending her dick sketches, <laughs> and it hasn't progressed from there. Mm. The police let this go. What they do find, which is far more important, is an anonymous letter to Rose that has been posted the previous day, which reads, I will try to see you tonight at 12 o'clock at your place if you put a light in your window at 10 o'clock for about 10 minutes, then you can take it out again. Don't have a light in your room at 12 as I will come round the back. It's very precise instructions. It is. I find that annoying. Yes, I, I agree, actually. It's just like, no, have a light in your window and I'll come for all the sex. Um, <laughs> That's the sign. Yeah. I don't know why it has to be so specific. And I don't know whether that, that, that warrants pulling apart. If it was me, and I'm an idiot, I would be terribly confused. I would just be going, what light, where, what? I would just have lights all over the place and semaphoring everyone with flags and lights. But this is clearly from someone who was arranged to meet her the mm. night she died. The police determined this must be from Rose's killer. Indeed. So the police, noting the rumours around the town about Rose and about what has transpired in previous mm -hmm. weeks determine it must be William Gardner. It must be. They have to talk and to him. And he was outside looking at the windows. Looking at the window, looking at the light. They examine the handwriting of the note and they conclude it has quite strong similarities to Gardner's own hand. Mm -hmm. Now, how accurate this is, we don't know. I'm not thinking that the superintendent on the case is a handwriting expert. No, I'm thinking they, well... It's written in a black pen. He owns a black pen. Therefore, it must be the same person. He could He write. spelt Rose with an R. <laughs> and you can't really blame the authorities for thinking, oh, right, you no, know what? I would leap to that conclusion as well, I have to say. I'm sure they are helped by the gossips of the village. Yes. I'm sure everyone they speak to are probably going, oh, do you know, William Gardner, oh, they, well, they, they hooked up, they had a, they had a, a relationship, and there, was, uh, there was something going on there, wink, mm. wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> Those exact words, obviously. Those exact words I used. Indeed. A few days later, William Gardner is arrested for Rose's murder, and he stands trial in Ipswich in November 1902. Now, the handwriting aside, the prosecution have built up evidence against him pretty quickly. Prosecution is led by Henry Dickens, Charles Dickens' son. Oh, nice. Yes, yes. That's good. This is just a little detail that I found buried somewhere. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, there we are. That's pretty good. He's like, Daddy, you love me now, Daddy. The man who had spoken to Gardner on the night before the murder took yes, place yes, yes. again reiterated how William had been purposefully looking at Providence House right at where the light was mm -hmm. to the point where he noted how he moved out of the doorway in order to get a clear line of sight to the window much has been made of this going oh well would would william have been able to see the window you have to actually move around slightly and cock your head to sort of see the light that that, that was there a lot of people were like there's not a direct line of sight between his house and her house but all you need to do is step slightly to the right and then they'd see it <laughs> people going no no there's no way that he would have done that no, no way people can step slightly to the right in the victorian period it, it's absolutely not it's it's unseemly yeah. it's not right the trousers weren't built for it you had to have special <laughs> shoes you have to have your side stepping shoes on now, maybe this witness is now building on the idea of like, oh, yeah, 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 but had seen him independently and noted that. There were also reports that William Gardner had lit a bonfire very early the next morning after the killing had taken place. Oh. And a neighbour who'd observed this thought this very strange. There's no reason to write a, light a bonfire that early in the day. It's strange out enough. He had stuff to burn. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. 
as I said, the villagers are only too quick to talk about how inappropriate conduct had been observed between William Gardner and Rose. There's even people saying that they had seen footprints between the victim's house and Gardner's house. And that is, I think that has been thrown out as in like, yeah. where did you see where, these? In the middle what? of a storm. Yes. You, you, you saw some footprints. I think a local gamekeeper was like, and I definitely saw this. And yeah, and it was just leading from that house to the other, covered in blood. It was like, where are they? Oh, storm washed that away. <laughs> Maybe the most damning evidence was that on closer examination of the medicine bottle found oh, yes. at the scene, it is labelled for Mrs. Gardner. Oh. It is medicine that has been prescribed the to wife. the family and it has her name on it. Mm, the, yes. the bottle, as we said, contained paraffin. So it's a fairly large-ish medicine bottle. Mm. They were back in the day. But it's been used to store paraffin. Was that brought to the scene? Was it already there? Had William used this bottle from his own household to carry the paraffin that he hoped would eliminate the crime scene? And also the police did examine a knife that Gardner carried. It's not uncommon for men to carry small well, knives yeah, for hunting. Yeah. They found blood on the hinges, but of course yeah. they can't test the yeah. blood. And he yeah, says... Oh, a rabbit. He did, exactly yeah. said that. He said, I've been skinning a rabbit and I yeah. do that a lot. So, no, nah, I've got a knife. It's going to have blood on it. The defence attacks with full force as much as the prosecution does. Gardner, they say, is a victim of rumour and gossip. He is a fine-standing member of the community. He has never done anything wrong. He is a very highly held up in reputation. Apart from this, just horrible gossip. He is not guilty of this. William Gardner's wife and the neighbour vehemently deny his involvement in this and they absolutely swear William never left the house that night. <laughs> his wife, Georgina, claims he was in bed all night. The neighbour, who was up all night because she was afraid of the storm, she said she would have heard them if they'd gone out. She did hear Mrs Gardner. I think she's got a bloody glass to the wall, nosy old <laughs> bitch. But she heard Mrs Gardner get up and tend to the children. She did not hear him leave. They are both like, no, absolutely not. Georgina claims the medicine bottle she had given to Rose weeks ago. Okay. She had had illness in the house with the children. Rose was also unwell. She had given her the medicine and said, take some more of the medicine. Oh, it's you. They did know each other socially. She would call in on okay. the house. What kind of relationship is there? We don't know. But she claimed that she gave her the medicine bottle. That's why Rose had it. And it was Rose who had topped it up with paraffin for the paraffin lamps. Okay. I mean, she, she, she surmised that. Yeah, yeah. That it was, well, why yeah. ever it was filled with paraffin was down to Rose entirely possible yes. mm. and of course they mention the other dirty letters that rose has received it's a good defense point really isn't it to say yeah. the defense really do go for it yeah. they will paint rose as someone who wasn't unknown to other men they're gonna slate the victim mm. essentially to clear william gardner's name she could have been seeing anyone anyone could have been the father of that child you can't blame william gardner for this crime he denies it and look at all of these letters and these filthy poems they leave nothing to the imagination <laughs> i did skirt search to see if i could find any of oh, them. i want to know i know I read one. <laughs> and sketches and drawings so if she's a sort of woman with this sort of thing in her possession that she keeps rather well, than indeed. throws you, away you burn such scandalous things how can you take her word or her character over no. this noble man's maybe they even try to put out it was a terrible accident a rose falling down the stairs and brutally tragically stabbing herself in the chest and cutting <laughs> her own throat and setting herself on fire i mean it's 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 a it's a it's a, an accident of the oldest time really <laughs> so and it is they do argue it and people you know it, stranger things have happened now where people go could it have been an accident if she fell down and then landed on the broken glass and it stabbed her in the thing and then cut her throat and then it'd be the fire everywhere maybe 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 no no, no, no absolutely not no. well the jury deliberated but they failed to reach a unanimous yeah. decision. Eleven members were for guilty, but one was not convinced. Ooh. And at the time, that required a yeah. retrial. Everyone in the courtroom, all of the villagers, and even the judge speaks unfavourably about William Gardner. But one member, this one member of the jury, will nice not be convinced. Nice balance, yeah. fair trial. The judge is going, hang him! He did it! He, yeah, he, he sticks with that. God damn it, he really does. Two months later, the same evidence is presented, the same witnesses. Nothing really changes, but they are still putting this point across. And the judge continues to be you know, unfavourable towards well, William Gardner. Well, they've changed the jury now. They've got rid of that chap and put something else in. This time, they still don't reach a verdict. Mm -hmm. It's alleged that 
it's completely the opposite this time around. 11 are for acquittal and one is for guilty. So they try to mix them up. I don't know. But either way, it's the second trial that's failed. So he goes off to jail to await a third trial. Third trial never comes. Mm. The Crown dropped its case against William Gardner. It's going to be expensive, isn't it? So... And he is set free. He's mm-hmm. one of the only people to have stood trial and to not have a verdict. Oh. So Lucky it's him. it's not unproven. It's not acquitted. It's yeah. not free or anything. It, that's just it. There's no verdict, even though he stood trial for murder. In this day and age, he would have been convicted. That would be it. You know, we can do the majority now. Yeah. Everyone was against it. He would have been convicted. But that one person in the first jury saved him from the death sentence. William Gardner lived a pretty sad life. Until his death in yeah. 1941. I can't imagine he had much fun after that. No, he moved to London. The family moved to London. Yeah. But suspicion of this brutal murder following him everywhere, with people muttering that there's no smoke without fire. He was Jack the Ripper! <gasps> he was Jack the Ripper! Decades afterwards! <laughs> the cross on the grave of Rose Harsent read, in affectionate remembrance of Rose Annie Harsent, whose life was cruelly taken on the 1st of June, 1902, in her 23rd year. A light is from our household gone. A voice we loved is stilled. A place is vacant in our home that can never be filled. Oh, poor Rose. So, who could have been guilty? Was it William Gardner? I mean, it seems very dramatic. It seems a, it seems a leap. Okay, even if he was carrying on an affair mm-hmm. with this woman, to go from that to killing someone... And in such a premeditated way, okay, he's taken a bottle of paraffin with him to to set her on fire afterwards. Mm. That's, it seems like quite a jump. So a lot of people do think William did it. Mm. And it was because she told him about being pregnant and was demanding money. Saying, you need to support me. If that got out, his reputation absolutely he's gone. He's already got six kids. He's married. Yep. I think so. He's got yeah, six kids. Maybe. His his job, he wouldn't have a job anymore. True. Yeah. He'd be fired or he'd just be ridiculed. He And also, how can he afford to support this child and also weather the scandal? So yeah, he was... He was desperate. Determined to shut her up and prevent the story that he had been denying so publicly yeah. for ages from getting out. The theory around the burning as well is is quite quite gruesome but the idea that someone was trying to not necessarily burn her whole body but cover the fact that she was pregnant yeah, I mean, it, you're, it's you're it's gonna stupid have to do a lot of burning to get that much evidence gone yeah you're having to destroy the whole bloody corpse to, exactly yeah it, it's, it's pretty naive but yeah. but something like that so was it william or was it his wife nick no that is a theory that has been is explored it? and some people believe a jealous wife that it was Georgina, that she learned of the affair between Rose and her husband. She also learned that Rose was pregnant. And this is, again, the idea is this woman has had six children. She's going to be able to spot when someone's pregnant. True, true, yes. So if she knows and she thinks it's likely, and then she sees this girl is pregnant, she's like, right, okay, my life is, is going to be destroyed by this girl. The knowledge of the affair has driven her mad and the risk that the illegitimate child is going to pose to her own reputation, her children's livelihood, is enough to drive her to murder. It's clearly a frenzied attack that Mm, takes place. True. Again, covering up the pregnancy. Remember the newspaper by the body? Yeah. Oh, yes. The one used to start the fire. Yeah. That newspaper was not readily available in the area, but the gardeners had a subscription. Hmm. Mm. So that would lead me more towards him than her, I have to mm. say. The other options people have explored is, was it one of those random lovers? Well, this is true. She appeared to have many. Um, Fred? Fred, the dick pic man. That's the thing. It's like He sent her the dirty letters. Is he more than a fool in love? Is he just a predator who is taking things too far and Jealous driven mad? Because, yeah. because William was getting his way with with the lady and he couldn't and she was leading him on in yeah. his eyes and then exactly. just went absolutely he crazy was wooing her with sketches of his knob yes um, and he was like look i can draw it bigger honestly <laughs> it could be this random attack and a horrible thing would be again the burning could be to try and cover evidence if she was assaulted or anything you know there's there's no reports on that there's even theories that it was mr and mrs crisp that's it it there's was the crisps the, there's the theories that the mistress had yeah. had killed her because she was disgusted by her behavior Absolutely. And ended up in a massive Bring fight scandal upon this house scandal you carrying on these horrendous whorish ways under this roof indeed i would kill you it also 
makes you think with the bottle of the medicine and the newspaper. You know, it could be a very clever placement of... Uh, why would you bring in something with your name in it to a murder scene? Like, why would you do that? Yeah, well, indeed. That seems very silly. It's stupid. It is stupid. Unless it was planted there. Nah. Not yeah. Even. Yeah, a lot of these times. Oh, that was planted there to, to point fingers at other people. Yeah, like, yeah, it was, you... no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever happened, poor Rose was murdered that mm. night. And who did it? We may never know. Probably not. That is the story of the Pizen Hall murders. Very mm, good. Very famous unsolved mystery. Unsolved, just. Da, 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 da. Oh, very nice. I like that one. Yes. Mm, any any good. particular story? You're just convinced it was him then. I think out of the ones who we have, yes, that have been laid out there. I think I think more than likely it was it was him. As you said, I'm, I'm yeah. That's a good thing or a good argument to say. Yeah, she announced that she was pregnant. You need to support me and your child. Mm. Um, and he went. Fuck no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got six on my own. I'm bloody church organist. If this gets out, yeah. then I, there's already rumours around town. If it comes yeah. out now that you've got a bloody child, yeah. then I'm fucked. So I, I'm going to go with the wife. Oh, see, I'm not convinced by the wife. Why, do, why not? Why not? I don't know. You know, she could be She could be a cold-hearted bitch. Well, she could be. Y- yeah, we don't. Well, that's the thing is we don't know much about her. And we don't know much about the crisps either. Yeah. You know, William has had a sterling reputation since then, and there's no history of violence that anyone has reported. I mean, that is a. If it was the wife, that yeah. I mean, that is a huge amount of sort of planning and plotting and scheming to do that, and yeah. sort of knowing it's happening, and then I don't know, either following her husband up that evening mm. or. Or making, did she write the letter to to I make mean, her meet, like to to set it up, I and mean, then go? This is giving an awful lot of criminal sort of <laughs> genius cunning plan to I mean she may well be she was the she was an evil genius potentially yeah. but she's also a housewife of six in a little village in suffolk so yeah i perhaps don't think she was running a criminal mastermind empire well there's also the idea is that they did it together that the husband and wife covered for each other so did she confront him she followed him to the liaison and that he went round and did she catch them and then they're like oh she's pregnant okay we've got to kill her and one of them killed and and they covered for each other yeah. you know that that she knew that william had done it and that she was very willing to lie because if if he did do it then she's lied through her teeth about him sleeping in the bed all night mm. she knows he's gone out and the neighbor also Maybe. knows why would the neighbor lie well, i think the neighbor doesn't know what she's doing <laughs> I think she's, just, she's just a batty old lady who lives next door who's scared of thunderstorms um, who's scared of thunderstorms um, so she hasn't got a clue what's going on yeah um, they seem to have worked out a nice alibi the three of them yeah there which no i th- yeah. I, th- I, th- I think probably him okay then but i i may well be entirely wrong or it could be the crisps or it could be the crisp i, I mean i'm quite liking that sort of like <gasps> horrified old woman sort of what if thing. the baby was the masters of the house what if she'd been shagging Mr. Crisp? Mr. Crisp, maybe. Oh. Oh. And well. and Mrs. Crisp found out and Mailed, meted out yes. a vicious punishment. Maybe so. And it That's was a possibility. Yeah, it was just coincidence about the medicine bottle and the uh, yeah and the paraffin. That was all all coincidence. Yeah, no, not. Yeah. not a lot is talked about the the crisps. Yeah. You know, so maybe it's a big cover up. A big, yes, absolutely, a big Suffolk base cover up. <laughs> Those crisps are powerful, powerful family. They are. They know where the potatoes are kept. <laughs> well, what do you think, people? The Peas and Hall murder mystery. Do you know the case? Do you have theories and thoughts? Are there suspects that we haven't addressed? Is there a vicar in the village who, who was responsible for everything? Send us your thoughts. Jump on the comments of wherever you listen to this episode and tell us what you think about it. But most importantly, make sure you mix up one of our delicious cocktails on Friday. Well, indeed. So, fire and brimstone. I mean, I've drunk it. It's gone down a treat. <laughs> You're very Absolutely. red. Am I? No. <laughs> <laughs> the initial oomph of chilli was quite over, was quite strong but as I got into it and it's mellowed with the dilution from the ice incredibly pleasant like that one I must admit the hypothetical Paloma not so much of a fan of the smoky coke or smoky smoky cokey smoky cokey yep yeah, perfectly fine I'll probably drink that yeah. that's nice so that's perfectly pleasant so I think we'll probably try and put all three out on Friday hooray um, and you can take your pick have all of them at once in a big bite 
have the so non-alcoholic good. and then just have the and then just drink to reward yourself for having a non-alcoholic <laughs> drink that means you can have two <laughs> yes, i feel virtuous therefore i can have all the booze now tell your friends about the poisonous cabinet leave us a review if you haven't already on apple itunes send us suggestions of more stories that you we can cover and do come and find and follow us on patreon where there are loads of extra episodes and bonus content and we get a little crazy over there uh, there's been some mad stories this week involving turnips, so you don't want to miss that. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh.